साइबर टेक्नोलॉजी इंस्टीट्यूट यूके एन सी एस सी ई पी एस आर सी एकेडमिक सेंटर ऑफ एक्सेलेंस इन दाइबर सिक्योरिटी रिसर्च एट दी डी मॉनफोर्ट यूनिवर्सिटी ही रिसीव हिज पी एच डी इन कंप्यूटिंग फ्रॉम यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ साउथ वेल्स यूके इन टू थाउजेंड नाइन एम एस सी विद डिस्टिंगशन इन पर्सनल एंड मोबाइल सैटेलाइट कम्युनिकेशन फ्रॉम यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ ब्रैडफोर्ड यूके इन टू थाउजेंड फोर bl in computer engineering from the federal university of technology nigeria in 2000 he has previously worked as a research fellow at the center of secure information technology queens university belfast north ireland from 2012 to 2017 where he led the mobile security research team whilst working on mobile malware related projects supported by macfi He has also previously worked at the University of Ulster, North Ireland, from 2010 to 2012 as postdoctoral research on the EPSRC DST funded India UK Advanced Technology Centre of Excellence in Next Generation Networks. Dr. Suleiman is on the program committee of several international conferences and serves as reviewer of several international journals, including Computers and Security. I triply transaction in information forensics and security. He was the recipient of IET Information Security Best Paper Premium Award in 2017. His current research interests are in malware, applied machine learning, mobile security, behavioral bio biometrics, network security, and digital forensics. I welcome uh, Dr. Suleiman for his lecture today. Maybe I'll share the screen. Yeah, is the screen uh, okay? Yep. Yeah. You can start. You can start. Okay. Uh, Professor Vina, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me in this talk. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's afternoon here in the UK, um, uh, in Leicester, during this lockdown, uh, presenting this from my house. So it's a delight to be here with you people today. So the topic today I'm going to be talking about is mobile botnet detection, a deep learning approach using convolutional neural networks. So as Professor Vinod has said, I'm from Cyber Technology Institute uh, of Damon Fort University in Leicester, which is in the West uh, East Midlands of the United Kingdom. Next. So an introduction has already been made, so there will be no need for me to say anything here again. Uh, so let's move to the next slide. So basically today, I'll be talking about the work that we've done on Android botnet detections using convolutional neural networks. So the outline of the talk will start with an introduction and a general background on several topics that are related to the work. And I'll then move on to tell you about the aims and the motivations for the study, the reasons why we decided to embark upon this study and the, what, the reason why we did it the way we did. Then I will look at the approaches and the methodologies that we have applied and explain them. Then I'll present the experiments that we've undertaken to evaluate our approach. And I will talk about the results that we obtained. And at the end, we will conclude the talk and I'll tell you what my intentions are for the future work in this area. Now, by way of introduction, let us look at mobile malware landscape today. The amount of mobile malware that has been discovered is growing exponentially. And if you look at the graph that is at the right, at the top right here, you can see that from 2016 to 2018, we had an increase from 10 million individual up until it's a massive increase. And when you look at the bottom graph, it shows you the statistics by quarter. So it shows you that for each quarter from 2016 to 2018, 
there was no less than 1.5 million individual pieces of mobile malware that were discovered in the wild. So this statistics tells you that on average, the uh, antivirus companies will see about 20,000 new mobile malware pieces every day. So this is quite a challenge in terms of detection because when you use a signature-based approach in your antivirus program, for example, it's impossible to be able to generate signatures that will be able to track this number of malware uh, samples imagined every day. Now, it is true also that on the mobile platforms, of course, there are many mobile operating systems in use today, but the most popular one today that is uh, globally most prevalent is the Android operating system. So it's no surprise that um, the mobile malware will target the most popular operating system, which is Android. So in the next slide, I'll talk about the contributing factors to the prevalence of malware on Android. Now, the first thing is that Android is an open source operating system. So basically, you can um, have the operating system adapted, you can have it packaged in different forms. Uh, it's not a world guarding environment where we don't know what is happening. So because it's open source, and also it uh, allows you to install applications from whatever source you wish. And these applications come from, come from different sources. So you can basically have the official uh, store, which is the Google Play, or many other types of stores that are um, actually uh, in existence. For, for example, the ones that you can see on the right hand of the screen here. So. One thing that is peculiar is the fact that not all of these diverse sources of applications will be monitored or policed. Uh, Google Play does have uh, several monitoring um, uh, tools that they use. One of them is Bouncer, which they use on the platform, and they also use Google Play Protect on the devices. So, but you cannot guarantee that other sources of applications will have any monitoring or scrutiny to prevent malware from being downloaded from those platforms or from those markets. Another reason that contributes to the prevalence of malware on Android is the fact that it has a course permission model. So when you're installing an application on an Android operating system from Google Play or from any other source, you are asked to accept the permissions that the application is requesting. And Sometimes, I mean, uh, basically the model is for you to accept all of the permissions or none of the permissions. Although the newer versions of Android have started making this quite uh, granular such that you can disable certain permissions. The problem with this is that when you, you sometimes don't accept all of the permissions, the uh, application may not have all of the functionality that is desired. And the Attraction also for malware authors is the fact that monetization is very easy with the Android platform. So you have your SMS uh, and premium rate calls whereby money can be made. So this can be abused by malware. And you also have advertisements uh, that can be run on the apps themselves. So this is a source of money for app developers, which can also be hijacked by the malware and abused. Now, having looked at the contributing factors, let's uh, just do a brief recap of uh, botnets in the next slide. So a botnet basically consists of internet connected devices that are under the control of botmasters. And this control happens through command and control channels or command and control servers. So as you can see from the figure that is shown on the slide, it shows an architecture of an attack flow from a botmaster to several targets. And in the extreme right, you can see that nowadays the targets do not consist only of computers, but also all types of devices that we can consider to be Internet of Things, as well as websites, um, cameras, light controls, uh, smart locks, and what have you. So basically, 
the bot masters will send commands to the bots that they have under their control, depending on the kind of malicious activities that they want to um, enable or attack on the target. So it could be for spam campaigns, it might be maybe a distributed denial of service attack, it may be to infect those systems and further steal information from them, or it could be to send uh, out phishing emails. And so the list goes on and on. So in the next slide, you would see also that one thing that is interesting about botnets is the fact that they can be rented or sold out to people that have a particular malicious activity in mind. For example, as you can see, the scenario here is showing a spammer that has rented out, uh, rented a botnet or bought a botnet from a hacker that has the bots under their control. So they're then using this to send spam to unsuspecting users. So in the next slide, we are looking more closely at botnets on Android. So basically, uh, an Android bot or a mobile bot is a type of malware that once installed on a mobile device, will take over the device, it will run automatically on receiving commands and to um, communicate with the command and control servers, receiving instructions and sending updates to those uh, servers or to the bot masters directly. So basically, every smartphone that is infected then becomes added to the network of mobile bots that is managed by the cyber criminals. Uh, in the next slide, I'm going to talk about the first Android bot infections that were uh, discovered, and that was in 2011, around the end of 2010, 2011. The attack or the, the malware that was found at the time that were bot uh, like were called Droid Dream and Gemini or Gemini. So these two bots uh, of uh, malware were basically Trojans, which means that they were uh, embedded in um, applications that seem to have a legitimate functionality. For example, games, uh, it was embedded in other type of fun apps, utility applications and educational apps and what have you. Now, Droid Dream was um, distributed through the official Google Play channel. And it affected thousands of um, smartphones, Android phones uh, all around the world. Um, so it's considered one of the uh, first sophisticated bots that was found um, through the uh, and distributed through the Android uh, Google Play market. Um, it was basically able to root the device, take over the device, um, install whatever uh, payload or whatever additional malicious um, uh, program that it wanted to. It could um, be used to spy on the phone, collect information and send it to the servers. Um, so, of course, as time has gone on, Droid Dream and Genini, those uh, botnets that have uh, virtually been minimized or almost disappeared. But an example of a more recent Android button is one called Charmons. So Charmoise was discovered in 2016, and the Android security team at the time found this to be a very sophisticated botnet, and they were able to fight it and almost eliminate it in 2016. Uh, it was distributed through Google Play and third-party app stores, but by the time it was put off in 2016, it came back in 2017, and it came back in a very different form and was able to um, infect more than 20.8 million Android devices between November 2017 and March 2018. So with the fact that it came back even more sophisticated meant that the Android security team had to adapt their way of fighting this malware or this botnet, and they were successfully able to bring it down to 1.8 million by last year. So as it is now, it's a cat and mouse game between the developers of Chamois and the Android security team. 
Um, now, one thing that makes this bot very sophisticated is the fact that it can disguise the, the, the authors are very sophisticated developers. They, they distributed this through means like um, libraries or third party advertisement development kit. So basically, they entice people into using this kit to embed the malicious bot into their apps. Um, so this is one of the sophisticated ways that botnets have become um, emergent nowadays. So let's move on to the next slide. And I will talk about the infection mechanisms. So your smartphone or your Android device can be infected by worms, trojans, viruses that have bot-like capability. And this infection can happen through email attachment. It can be through repackaged applications. These are free applications that are enticing, um, but have been repackaged by malware authors to contain also the bot um, payloads. Or it could be something like a fake antivirus program or fake utility program. It can also be embedded on websites that you can download uh, from while you're surfing. Or it can be through drive-by downloads, where when you visit a particular website, you get redirected to the location where the botnet is actually hosted. So um, in the next slide, you look at what is possible for bot masters to do with your bot infected smartphone or smart device. Now, they can send orders to the smartphone, like we've mentioned before, through the command and control channel to exploit it mainly for profit. And this can be done anytime and from any location, uh, anywhere in the world. So one of the things that you can do with these uh, bots is to attack websites and to use that to take over user accounts on those websites. And so that attack is called credential stalking attack. And I'm going to talk about it a bit more from the next slide. Um, you can use it to steal credit card details, usernames and passwords, to send uh, SMS to premium numbers so that they can profit from that, and also be able to block incoming SMS messages, which may be notifications uh, coming from providers or your banking and so on and so forth. So they can also copy your messages and contacts and upload them to a server. They have the capability to install or remove other applications. So basically, the initial application can look like a harmless application that will later on be able to install a more harmful application later on. And other things are dialing phone numbers, distributing spam, um, being used for ad fraud, uh, opening uh, malicious pages or ad pages to gain more clicks and, and generate more revenue for themselves. And they can also organize the bots into an army that can launch a denial of service attack on the network or computer or website. So in a nutshell, these are the, some of the kind of attacks that can be done when your smartphones have been taken over by bot masters. So, the next slide I'll be talking about the credential stopping attack because that's an interesting new type of attack that has been noticed in recent times. So what is credential stopping attack? It's basically using a list of usernames and passwords that are gathered from breaches in order to attempt to log into this target site. So it's like trying to maliciously attempt to log in into an account automatically. So the reasons for this might be to pretend to be a particular account owner, that's assuming a, a false identity. The intention might be to gather more information from those sites or to steal money or gain some uh, financial rewards such as goods and anything else that might be offered on such websites. Now, this type of botnet activity is very, very stealthy. When you compare that to a denial of service attack, for example, now your denial of service attacks are usually high volume traffic and high frequency or high frequency traffic. That's the way it's characterized 
But with the credential stuffing attack, it's very low volume traffic and very low frequency. So in this case, you might not even notice that your mobile device is doing anything at all because with low frequency and low volume of traffic or low volume of communication, your battery doesn't get drained. You don't notice any um, spike in traffic uh, or bandwidth taking up. So it's very, very difficult to determine the fact that this kind of attack is taking place. Now, the prime targets for this kind of attacks have been financial institutions such as banks and other financial institutions and retail websites, basically, because these are websites that people visit very, very, very frequently. Okay, so the next slide. So here, I'll talk about a report that uh, contains a study that has been done by Akamai. So Akamai studied credential login traffic between 2017, November and uh, June 2018. And they noticed about 30 billion malicious login attempts. And a lot of these malicious login attempts came from bots. A large, uh, some a proportion of it came also from bots that were uh, originating from smartphones. And they noticed in this study that one bot created up to 300,000 malicious login attempts in one hour, okay? Now, the attacks are low and slow. So as you, see, you will see when I come to the graph, I'll explain. You can see at the bottom of the graph there, there's a gray area that is showing you malicious login attempts, while the, uh, the other pattern, um, reddish, um, a line is showing you legitimate login attempts. So it's slow and low because the bots will attack multiple domains and they will be hiding their activity by the fact that by the time they cycle through all these domains, for each domain will have seen the same botnet traffic maybe once every couple of times, okay? So within that study, uh, the login attempts made to a financial institution, a particular financial institution, within a week was collected. And what was seen was about 4.2 million legitimate login requests by the customers in that week. At the same time, there were some credential stuffing attempts that were made, but this was just a very, very small percentage. It amounted to 1.5%. So that shows you how low the traffic was. So when we look at the graph now, you can see that uh, starting from the beginning, so that is a collection of one, one day, I think, or one week. Now you can see that it rises, uh, there's a particular pattern of legitimate logins, and the highest you can get is about more than four, almost 46,000 legitimate requests per hour. Now you will see that the malicious login attempts were a little bit steady, then they went up and then came down again. They reached a peak of about 8,723 uh, malicious login attempts per hour and went down to 797. So basically the way this attack was fashioned was the, the, the spikes you can see there for the malicious attempts were a denial of service attack. So basically very high rates of um, malicious uh, attempts from one IP address, which was a diversion tactic. So the security guys thought that they had found a DDoS attempt taking place on the website. And so they mitigated it, but at the same time, there were slower malicious login attempts that were coming from uh, different IP addresses. So that was the way the attack was partial. So there was a diversion technique, whereas Within that same denial of service attack, there was uh, a credential stuffing attack taking place. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I want to talk also about another study by Empower, whereby they study mobile botnet activity. So Empower is a company that is well known for uh, making security controls, most especially uh, web, web application firewalls and other types of similar security controls. So on their network, they know that mobile net activity has been increasing in recent times. 
So they started 100 million mobile devices on their network from uh, six major cellular carriers in the United States for 45 day, over a 45 day period. And they found that 5.8% of these um, mobile devices hosted bots that were used to attack websites and applications. So that uh, equates to 5.8 million devices that were being controlled without the user even knowing that the, their devices were bots. So these bots were not used for traditional denial of service attacks or spam campaigns, but they focus on attacking website for financial gain. So this um, reinforces the study that the Akamai company made uh, as well as uh, saying that the kind of attacks that are being done nowadays is attacking websites for financial gain and uh, the volume of traffic, as you've seen in the next slide, is quite low as well. So much lower volume of traffic um, than has been previously seen in both infected devices. So this is also low and slow and highly targeted. So what they noticed was that uh, uh, a mobile bot or a device could average only 50 requests a day. That is much less than the kind of activity that one would normally do on their own phone, uh, maybe when they're browsing or they're uh, accessing online services. Now, another thing that is very interesting about the use of mobile networks for botnet activity is the fact that when you have a cellular um, network, a gateway can use one IP address for up to 4,000 devices. So it means anytime you are on the move with your mobile device, your IP address is changing rapidly. Okay. So it becomes very difficult to use uh, any solutions that is based on creating blacklists or trying to use IP addresses to block the traffic and prevent the botnet activity. So let's move to the next slide. So this brings us to a consideration of preventive measures. So we, we can talk about a proactive measure that tries to stop the botnet even before it becomes active or that tries to stop botnets from growing that is through recruiting new um, devices or we can talk about reactive um, measures such as those that have been used in DDoS attacks whereby you filter the traffic when you notice there is a DDoS attack happening and then you are able to mitigate it by maybe limiting the rate of traffic. The traffic. So unlike DDoS attacks, when you have low and slow botnet activities like the ones I've just described, it's very difficult to spot through traffic analysis. And many traditional traffic filtering approaches will not be very effective in spotting and stopping those type of botnet attacks. So we need proactive measures. We need preventive or disruptive measures uh, that, that are more effective. Now, on the mobile platform, there's opportunity to do proactive detection whether it is on the device or even from the point of distribution, which is the marketplace. And one way to do this is to apply static analysis with machine learning techniques. So static analysis is basically analyzing an application, extracting some characterizing features, and then using machine learning to learn those features so that it can then be used to discover new instances of mobile bots. So that brings me to the main study that we've done in the next slide. The aim of the study of this convolutional neural network based on robotic detection. So the aim is to propose and to evaluate a deep learning approach for Android body detection based on convolutional neural network. So convolutional neural network is a deep learning approach. So a deep learning approach because it also uses several layers deep of a neural network uh, in the hidden part of it. So we'll talk about that more later. Um, so the approach is based on static features and the aim is to classify any unknown application as a botnet or a normal application so that we can identify buttons quickly, early, and proactively. Now, what motivated this study was the fact that we need to continue to improve our proactive approaches for filtering potentially harmful applications. Um, 
So traditional machine learning and algorithms have been used. There's so many algorithms like spot vector machines. We have naive bias. We have tree-based algorithms. We have logistic uh, logistic based algorithms and so many other um, machine learning techniques. So this might not provide the best detection accuracy. So it's useful to look at techniques such as deep learning or convolutional neural networks and see whether or not we're going to get better performance from this. Because the, the, the better uh, the performance we get from our models, the more we're able to stop the prevalence of uh, botnets. And also to look at the advantages that convolutional neural networks can offer, especially when you have one dimensional features, which I'll explain in the coming slides, and to reduce the need for future pre-processing. So let's move to the next slide now. So on this slide, you can see a simplified overview of the way the system works. The first aspect of it is feature extraction, then training and classification. So if you look at the uh, left side of the figure, you will see that we have botnet applications and normal applications that are collectively used to uh, extract features that represent each of these applications. So this is what we call the training corpus. So we apply this training corpus uh, to a, um, a script or a tool that will extract features from that and format these features in a way that can be fed into a machine learning based model in order to train that machine learning based model. So the feature vectors, the way we have used them in this particular work is to represent them in binary format. Talk a bit more about that later. So then that those feature vectors that represent the botnet and normal apps will be fed into the training phase uh, for a convolutional neural network based classifier. And once you obtain the trained model at the bottom, you can then use that trained model to um, look at what a new application is and you can predict whether or not that is a normal application or botnet application. So in a nutshell, that's how the system is uh, aimed to work. So let's move to the next slide. So I want to give a brief overview of an Android application because the core of the system is based upon extracting features from an Android application. So these are static features like I've mentioned before, which means we can extract these features from the application itself. So the application is an APK, which is basically several files zipped together. So it contains a manifest file, and that manifest file is a file that has configuration information. It tells you where, uh, what permissions an application it's going to request, and it declares the components that the applications would have, and also what kind of hardware you might want to use, and so on and so forth. Um, then it has an executable file, and the executable file is known as a Dalvik executable file or dex file. So this executable file will be executed in a Dalvik virtual machine on the device, and that is where most of the programming functionality is embedded. And then we have other folders like the assets folder and resources folder. So these folders are used to hold lots of resources that you use in creating an application, for example, pictures, tables, and so on and so forth, but uh, or, or third party libraries, for example. Now, one of the things about these uh, folders is the fact that malicious payloads can be hidden here because there's hardly any restriction to what can be held in the especially the resources folder. So in a nutshell, that's the uh, how an Android application is structured. Now, our tool that we built was to uh, automatically reverse engineer the APK and extract the features, which will be explained in the next slide. Now, the tool was developed in Python, and what it does is to extract characteristics from these uh, sections of the application that I've explained. For example, to extract API calls from the Dalvik executable 
and permissions and intents from the manifest files, command signatures will be uh, looked for within several last uh, parts of the application. Other app characteristics like presence of embedded files as well. So like I've mentioned before, when these features are extracted, we have a binary presentation to show whether any of these features exist, whereby when they exist, we represent it with a one. If it doesn't exist, we represent it with a zero. So the next slide will show you some examples of features. So as you can see from the table here, we have some API features, which are basically functions. Like the first one is telephony manager .get device ID. So that's the function that you will use if you wanted to get the ID of the device. Uh, subscriber ID, if you wanted to get the number um, or the subscriber ID. About broadcast, if you wanted to, about um, any notification that the system might make. And then we have some permissions like permission to send SMS, permission to delete packages, to check the phone state, which can enable mal malicious software to know what the next action we should take. Um, to also be notified when SMS is received. Next one is an API to check for uh, address, um, IP address from socket, at socket level. Then we have read SMS permission, boot completed is an intent. So basically when an application registers this intent, it wants to know whenever the device has rebooted. So for malware that wants to remain persistent, it can listen for this broadcast and it will restart itself. So we have other ones like deleting uh, a file. Um, then we have commands like churn, chmod, and mom. Now the idea about looking the idea of looking for commands is because of the fact that um, some sophisticated malware might have scripts that will be executed at a lower level within the Android operating system. So remember, an Android operating system is a derivative of Linux. So basically, this kind of commands will be in scripts where they can be hidden um, within the application to execute certain functionality, maybe for routing the device and so on and so forth. And then we have others like APK, zip, dex, jar, this is looking for extra files. We have a camera, that's permission to view the camera, access find location, that is um, uh, permission to know about the location of the phone, installing packages, checking when the battery is low and whether power is connected. And then we have system.load library, which is a function that is used to load uh, code or uh, instruction from a native library or a um, basically a non-traditional um, Android application executable, so from a native library. Okay, so now let's move on to the next slide and look at convolutional neural networks. So. What is a convolutional neural network? Now, it's basically a uh, artificial neural network that belongs to the family of deep learning techniques. Now, as I mentioned before, the deep learning family of artificial neural networks are those neural networks that have more than one hidden layer. So traditionally, you will have a neural network. The structure would be to have an input layer hidden layer and an output layer. Now we have the, uh, you know, different way of doing things now, wherever you can have many layers deep. So the convolutional neural network belongs to that family of deep learning uh, techniques. And it's basically very good for pattern recognition. So it can identify simple patterns within data. And when it does so, it can then, then be presented to another layer that will then be used to discover more complex patterns in those subsequent layers. So that is the reason why the convolutional neural networks is very successful with image processing, for example, because when you look at a picture, it has several things that are embedded in it. Now, with this type of abstract way of extracting information from pictures, layer by layer, if you are 
able to identify things within images quite uh, accurately compared to other types of machine learning. Now, the two types of components of a CNN are mainly a convolutional layer and a pooling layer. The convolutional layer is that layer that extracts the features from your raw data and through our operation called convolution. And then your pooling layer is a layer that reduces dimensions of this uh, convolutional neural uh, layer. Okay. Now, in our work here, the features we have are one dimensional vector representation. So each application is rep represented by a vector that shows you the presence or absence of particular features as ones and zeros. So in this case, we are not doing an image processing type uh, application of convolutional neural network. So we will use what we call a one dimensional neural network. Okay. So one dimensional neural networks are quite popular with uh, natural language processing applications where you have uh, uh, trying to recognize speech, for example. Now, this work that I've done here and I'm presenting today is using direct uh, feature vectors that are extracted from an application directly into a convolutional neural network. One of the approaches that previous scholars have done is to first convert um, the features into images, just because of the fact that a convolutional neural network is typically applied to images. But we're not doing that in this work. We're we applying it directly because the more complex your CNN is, the more resources you need to train your model and the more time you need to train your model. So using a 1D CNN is also a time saver, also more resource efficient. So let's move to the next slide. So now in this slide, you can see a pictorial representation of our model, which is our convolutional neural network model. So it has two layers. You can see it has the first layer from the uh, left is your input layer. Then you have your first convolutional layer, second convolutional layer, fully connected layer, and an output layer. So starting from the input layer, you can see that the dimensionality of that layer is 342. So that represents the vector uh, dimension of each application. So basically with convolutional neural networks, you apply what we call filters. And you can see an example of three filters being shown working on the input layer. So we have a blue one, a red one, and a green one. So basically what happens is these filters are slided across the input layer in your convolutional operation. And as each filter slides across, it uh, gets the computational output into what we call a feature map. And as you can see in the next uh, in the convolutional layer, your feature maps are the results of aggregating the outcomes of the convolution on the input layer. Now, I've talked about the max pooling layer before, and I've said this is used for reducing dimensions. So as you can see there, the max pooling layer basically would take a portion of the feature map, and across that portion, it will look for the maximum value and output it. So that's how the dimensionality is reduced. Now, looking at the second convolutional layer, there's a feature map that no it doesn't do the actual classification the classification is done in the output layer because we have a binary classification the output layer will have only one um neuron or only one unit so the idea here is you either get a classification of zero or one which zero will represent normal application and one will be part of so in a nutshell, this is a picture, a pictorial representation of the convolutional neural network model that we built. So we use two layers as part of 
the model that was used in this work and one fully connected layer and then an output layer. So let's move to the next slide. So on this slide, I'm going to talk about the data set that we used for the study. Now we got the botnet applications from a data set called ISCX botnet data set, which is available from the University of New Brunswick. Um, this, but this data set has 1,929 applications from 14 different families, and it's been used in previous works as well, in previous scholars that have tried to develop uh, botnet detection um, schemes or methods. They've used them in their work. So um, in order to do our training of the model, because it's a supervised learning approach, we need also normal applications. So I had a collection of 4,872 clean applications, which together with the botnet applications gives us a total of 6,802 applications in the data set that was used for the evaluation of the convolutional neural network um, model that we built. So in the next slide, I will talk about the metrics that we use to evaluate the performance of our models. So the first one is the accuracy. So accuracy is a straightforward model because it's just a measure of uh, how much, how correct or the ratio of correct predictions that we have from the overall collection of predictions that we've made. The second one is the recall. So recall is also known as positive prediction rate. So this is a measure of true positives that the model has identified out of all possible positives. So in this case, we are making reference to our positive as a botnet or the botnet class. So the um, proportion of the botnet class that has truly been identified as botnet is your recall measure. Then we have precision. So this measures how right a model was when it predicts positive. So if your model predicts that an application on, on the test is botnet, to what extent is it correct? Okay. And so the lower this value is, the higher your rate of false positive. So it means that more and more of your normal applications were mistakenly classified as botnet. So the lower your precision, the, the, the less desirable your model is in the context of botnet classification. Now your F1 score is the weighted average of the two measures. So it's like an overall measure that gives us a, a good picture of how well the model does. Now let's look at the experiments that we have um, performed to evaluate the models. Now there were two sets of experiments. The first one was the preliminary experiment. So the preliminary experiments were meant to evaluate the model and find the optimal configuration parameters. So the first aspect was to look at the number of filters, the impact of the number of filters, because when you, as you saw in the previous slide with the CNN model, you have several filters that are chosen, slide across the input um, layer and the first convolutional layer. So you, you need to find the optimal number of filters that will give you the best performance. So we, we measure the impact of changing this number of filters in a preliminary experiment. And then also the filters can have variable length. So we look at the effect of changing the length of the filters. And then also we look at the effect of changing the max pooling parameter or subsampling ratio. So what we mean by this is the fact that the max pooling is, is uh, governed by a ratio or, or a parameter whereby the higher it is, the the more uh, or the more the level of um, the more the level of um, reduction feature reduction is done on the previous um, output of the convolutional neural network. 
Now, those are the preliminary experiments. So for the main experiment is to compare or say co the optimal convolutional neural network model with other machine learning classification algorithms like SVM, random forest, uh, naive bias, and so on and so forth. And then lastly, we, we, we looked at the outputs of our um, work and compared it with the other works that have been published. So next slide. Now, I talked about training before um, because of the fact that this is a supervised learning um, approach. So we will use a corpus of uh, normal and botnet applications to train our model. So the training approach is to take 90% of those 6,802 applications and set it aside for training. And then we test on the remaining 10%. And then we flip it in tenfold, in 10 ways, so that all of the data set, part of all of the data set will be used as a test set. So that mimics an unseen application or a new application. Okay, so that's how we're able to measure how good our model is. Now, we have the technique of training is to train in different epochs. So every epoch, for example, is a period where a whole model is developed and then tested. So this testing is done on a training and validation set, okay? Now, when we measure things, uh, the measures that we take there are training loss and training accuracy. We want to select the model that will give us the least training loss. So as you can see in the graph at the left, we have training loss coming down at a different purpose or different uh, period from the beginning, and then it fluctuates, okay? Now, we have a criteria to stop the training because it keeps on going on and on in different approaches if you do not stop it. So the automatic criteria that we have put is when we notice that for 100 periods, there's not been any improvement in the validation loss, okay, in the validation loss for a, a hundred epochs, so we then stop the training. So in this particular example, we have training done on up to 145 epochs, so which means our optimal model was obtained at epoch 45. Okay, so that's what this graph is showing. So it's also uh, just as you can see from the graph, you can see training loss and validation loss are quite uh, close and training accuracy and validation accuracy are also quite close. So this is important because when they're too far apart, you begin to suspect that your model is overfitting. So let's move on to the next slide. Now on this next slide, is showing the results of the preliminary experiment where the number of filters have been varied from four, eight, 16, increased to 32 and then to 64. So, what you see in red there is showing you the maximum obtained result. So the maximum accuracy was obtained uh, at 98.9%, okay? Um, the precision was 98.3%, the recall was 97.8%, F1 score 0 0.981. So recall of 97.8% means 97.8% accuracy in botnet uh, detection, since we are considering the botnet to be the positive example. Okay, now what you will notice at the bottom is that as you increase the number of filters, the number of parameters that need to be tuned within the neural network itself increases. Uh, so it goes up from 2,777 to 59,000. So the more the number of parameters that are needed, the longer it takes to train your model. So the optimal here we have is 32 filters. Let's go to the next, uh, uh, yeah, 32 filters. Let's go to the next slide. So this one looks at the length of the filters. Uh, like I said before, we can vary them. So we started with four, increase it to eight, 16, 32, and 64. So we kept the number of filters at 32, and we varied the length of the filters. Now, there's not much impact the length of the filters have on the performance. So the at the lowest length of four, we have the best performance actually. So 
99% accuracy, uh, 98.3% precision, 97.8% recall, and F1 score of 0 0.9 each one. Again, you can see as you increase the length of the filters, the training parameters increase, which means it takes much longer to train with a filter length of four compared to filter length of 64. Sorry, it takes much longer to train with filter length of 64 compared to filter length of four. Okay, so let's move on to the next one, subsampling ratio, max pooling parameter. So a ratio of two is indicating that you are, you are, you are reducing um, the dimensionality from the convolutional layer by a factor of two. So you're halving that um, dimensionality. So when you go up to four, six, eight, those are further reductions. And as you can see, the, the more you reduce the features that come from the convolutional layer, the worse your performance gets. So we take to, to be the best uh, performing um, parameter. So your accuracy there is 98.9%, precision is 98.3%, recall 97.8%, F1 score is 0 0.9.1. Again, as you can see, with higher ratios, there are less training parameters, but we're interested in the accuracy here. So we, we still stick with two. Now, in the next slide, puts all of this together and shows you that the optimal configuration is for you to have 32 filters uh, for each of the layers, uh, to have four, a filter length of four for each of those filters, and to have a subsampling ratio of two, okay? So that's the optimal. Uh, and as you can see, each of them, you have the same, it's, that's the, the same result basically with the combination of those, um, parameters. So again, those parameters are known as your hyperparameters. So for your convolutional neural network, your hyperparameters are the parameters that you set before you actually run your model. Okay. Now let's look at the main experiment. So uh, the outcomes of the main, from the main experiment. So let's move to the next slide. Now uh, what is shown here is F1 is called from convolutional neural network versus other traditional machine learning classifiers. So you can see that the highest comes from the convolutional neural network model in its optimal configuration. Um, so SVM is next, we have uh, artificial neural network. So your artificial neural network here is a traditional neural network with one hidden layer, 32 units in that hidden layer. Uh, so it's a shallow network, not a deep network like your convolutional neural network. So you can see that the F1 score is 9.0.973, uh, which is the same thing you get with your simple logistic and your random forest. Uh, now your decision tree shows you 0 0.966, your rep tree 0 0.963, random tree 0 0.951, naive bias 0 0.795, bias then 0 0.71. And the next slide shows you more comprehensive breakdown of the results in the next slide. So you can see the accuracy, precision, recall, and F1. And the one highlighted in red is your convolutional neural network at the bottom. Um, when you look at the recall, 97.8% is higher than any of the other uh, machine learning techniques. So it means it gives the best ability to detect botnets as well as the best overall performance. Okay. So this is the main result of the study. So it shows that our convolutional neural network was successful. Now let's look at um, how this work compares with other works that have appeared in the literature. So in the next slide, In the next slide, you will see that we are comparing the results from this study with previous work, uh, one, two, three, four, five previous works. So the first one at the top is a very interesting one. That's because it also uses convolutional neural network. In that study, the authors used convolutional neural network, but what they did was to take the static um, 
features and convert those static features into images. Now, the difference between our study and theirs is that we used more of the benign uh, of the botnets from the ISCX uh, dataset, which is the same dataset that we use as well. And we also had more benign applications. So you can see that the accuracy that we got compared to theirs is 98.9% on ours, and then 7.2% was what they got. Okay. Someone is asking, is there any specific reason to compare F1 score for a CNN model with other machine learning techniques? Yes, we want to see whether it's it's giving us a better performance than other machine learning techniques because we we believe that it has properties that can be exploited to improve performance over other machine learning techniques. So we'll come back to that later. Now, if you look at the second study, um, is from 2016. They use 1,926 botnets from ISCX data set as well, and 150 benign applications. So their results are showing 97.2% precision and 6.9% recall. Uh, the other studies as well, all of these studies come from the ISCX uh, botnet data set. So they use that same data set, and you can see that the results that we obtained were better than what has been. Um, presented before okay so that's the end of the uh, presentation on this work so to give a recap uh, what we can draw by way of conclusion is the fact that your one-dimensional CNN is quite effective as an approach to detect Android buttons using this type of static um, features that are vectorized into binary form okay so that is quite effective so we don't have to go into the step of changing this or converting this into um, an image before we apply a convolutional neural network um, also there's no need for further pre-processing of features to achieve good results so inherently, the convolutional layers act as your feature processors, and your max pooling layer act as your feature selection or feature reduction uh, stage. Okay, and like I've mentioned before, use of binary vectors is quite sufficient as as um, input. Um, we've seen that the convolutional neural network outperformed the conventional machine learning algorithms and also outperformed. The artificial neural network or the shallow neural network in your Android botnet detection. So moving forward, what we want to do is to improve the model training. Uh, we want to be able to automatically search and select parameters uh, for, for optimal performance. What I presented was done manually. So we have to manually change these parameters and run the experiments again. So we want to do this, make this automated. Um, the next thing is to apply the same uh, CNN approach to a combination of static and dynamic features. So we want to look at extracting dynamic features and adding them to the static features, see whether we can uh, get you know, good performance from that as well. And then lastly, we want to look at longitudinal performance analysis of the models for button detection. So basically what this means is that creating models and then looking at the long-term performance of these models, whether when new um, applications come in future, whether this, the models will be able to be resilient enough to detect those without the need to retrain, or how long will it take us to be able to use our model before we find that we need to retrain it, okay? So that's the end of my talk. Uh, at the last, slide now we have a reference so the akamai study can be found in the first reference the impava study in the second one and the rest of them are the papers that i've compared my work to and at the very end is the paper that has been presented in the 2020 Cybersecurity conference here um, so that contains more details about the aspects of the work that I presented today here. So if you're interested, you can find that paper and delve more into the, uh, the paper. So 
that's the end. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to attempt to answer them. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Suleiman, for a wonderful uh, lecture. And uh, maybe for the information of the audience, uh, participants uh, like uh, Dr. Suleiman is very active in collaborating with uh, Department of Computer Science and Engineering. We recently had a paper submitted on uh, classification on TOR and non-TOR traffic data wherein we were par particularly uh, using the generative adversarial networks. Then uh, we are also involved with him uh, on one of the work on detection of uh, Android uh, malware obfuscation using the convolution neural network and also we have another work uh, uh, with him on the hate speech uh, uh, detection so the first work on the convolution neural network with uh, detection of obfuscation we we have uh, one of my colleague mrs dhanya she's also participating in this and maybe the students who are in this work are also there so before we go further, uh, there are certain questions uh, from the uh, speakers, so uh, the participants, sorry. So there is one question, like since bots are controlled using centralized servers, blacklisting the server would stop the attack. It, it is the question from Anson. So uh, yeah, so yeah, typically centralized way of um, command and control server is creating a single point of failure. So botnet um, creators have cleverly moved more away from centralized model to peer-to-peer -peer model or hybrid model, whereby even when you take down a centralized server, you end up uh, having you know, some a new one coming up or something like that. So this, the peer-to-peer allows you to not have a centralized server so basically that it's that might not necessarily take down the um the botnet so in the beginning when i talk about channels the way the botnet was effectively combated was by filing it on existing devices and on installing them using google pre protect mainly so that's one of the effective ways that we're able to be Android team was able to do it to, to, to target the endpoints themselves because the, the, the creators of one is very clever to find ways whereby they can actually disguise either command and control servers or the channels themselves. Okay. If we have further questions, maybe we can type in in the chat uh, window. So by the time, maybe we will take a quick uh, feedback from a few uh, people. Maybe Vishnu Ramesh, you are here. Maybe you can unmute Vishnu. Yes, sir, I'm, here. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Can I, you introduce? Can you introduce yourself and then you can yeah. start? Uh, my name is Vishnu Ramesh. I'm a student at SSCT, Computer Science Department. Yeah. Hi, sir. How are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, yourself, how are you? Uh, I'm also fine. Thank you for asking. Uh, thank you for accepting the invite and presenting a wonderful crisp yeah. and uh, short session amidst the COVID situations. Uh, I'm sure it gave the audience some insight on how easily Android phones are being used as botnets and uh, can harm potentially everybody, including the owner. And uh, it was also interesting to see that in your research, you have used one-dimensional CNN instead of converting them to images. Uh, was it that for speed or was it like uh, using a different approach other than using a 2D or 3D CNNs? Thank you. Professor Suleiman, there is a uh, like uh, Vishnu wants to ask like we used 1D convolution neural network mm -hmm. and uh, what was the motivation of using 1D CNN uh, instead of like the uh, two dimensional convolution uh, 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 CNN? 
like was it because of the speed uh, or the this type of input feature? well i know that the previous works have always been have mainly been based on uh, people converting the trying to convert their binaries for example even in normal malware the pc malware there's works that people have done way by they just they take their binaries and they try to convert them into images because naturally the yeah, convolutional neural network is quite efficient and effective for uh, image classification so that's the default way people were doing it so I, I was just curious to see whether that would work and i thought it would because of the fact that um, we have some work that we've done before that um, we used um, the byte codes from Dalvik. So these Dalvik byte codes we used, but then we had to have an embedded layer to come. And uh, uh, we have learned a lot from this session uh, regarding how to use a convolutional uh, neural network for uh, malware analysis. Uh, from this session, uh, it, it is uh, clear to us uh, how we can use uh, CNN for not only for the malware analysis, uh, for other domains also. Uh, now it is possible for us to apply this uh, method. And uh, being a researcher in the area of obfuscated malware detection, I have read your uh, papers. Uh, now I would like to mention some of uh, your papers, uh, DL Droid, Droid Fusion, then deep Android malware detection and some other papers uh, regarding the co uh, conventional machine learning models for uh, malware detection. So all these papers are uh, really useful for the researchers in the area of uh, malware analysis. Especially your paper, DL Droid, uh, deserves uh, special appreciation. All the concepts uh, related to the convolutional neural networks uh, well explained in that paper regarding how to design the architecture of a convolutional neural network and how to perform optimization um, algorithms on that convolutional neural networks. Uh, sir, uh, I have a small doubt regarding the uh, dynamic analysis. Uh, in that particular paper, I am taking this opportunity to discuss uh, uh, different methods for dynamic analysis. In that paper, you have uh, explained uh, stateless and stateful uh, dynamic analysis uh, mm -hmm. by using different uh, methods, uh, droid bot and a monkey runner. Mm -hmm. uh, how this uh, stateless and stateful uh, dynamic analysis differ uh, whether this uh, one is performed or uh, uh, I need some clarifications uh, regarding that uh, okay. method. Uh, right. Okay. So thank you very much for mentioning some of my works, and uh, I appreciate the fact that you you're finding it useful. That's very good to know. Yeah. Uh, for that work that you described, we use real devices, and um, one of the things I noticed while we've been doing dynamic analysis is that everybody just uses monkey and the fact is yes monkey is freely available is there why not why do you need to think of doing something else or using something else when uh, monkey will suffice and it seems to work so the reason behind that work was we were curious to find out whether if you used any sort of more intelligent um, approach to exercise your application whether you would be able to cover the code more because we know that with dynamic analysis one of the big issues is covering the code the code the code coverage is not always guaranteed there's so many reasons why you might start an analysis and you might never even reach where the malicious um, code is because of the fact that it could stop at the login page or whatever now the stateless one Obviously, it's randomized in nature. Um, you can, of course, you can uh, make it deterministic. Now, the stateful one, of course, is more intelligent. It can, um, it will send um, commands to the interface based on what it knows or what it has learned about the interface of the application or the state of the application. So, not only is it going to use less time to do that, 
but it will not be making um, random um, clicks or random tabs and what have you. So an advantage of that also is the fact that when you don't use random input, you have a better chance of not uh, making the application to crash. It's one of the things we, we, we found out that sometimes monkey will take your, not just your application, but your device into a state that you don't desire. And you, there's no way of knowing that you need to come out of that state. So that then ends your, your um, analysis. So yes, basically we, we, we were just curious, but the main thing we wanted to know is whether if the code coverage was going to be more when you use stateful uh, input, what impact will this have on machine learning classification already? Is there going to be a big gap or a narrow gap? Now, if there's a big gap, it then means that when we are doing this type of machine learning analysis, we should consider using better application exercise that exercise at the moment. So that was the motivation for this study. Um, so yeah, I, the the stateful method definitely showed um, a better result, definitely showed that we should consider more stateful approaches than monkey. That was the outcome, if I remember correctly. So have I answered your question or is there anything I missed? Uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, once again, thank you, sir, for uh, such a wonderful talk. Uh, you really okay. have paved the way for new researchers in the area of malware analysis. Thank you, sir. That's thank good. you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Vinod and SEMS Management for arranging such a fruitful session. Thank you. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Suleiman, we just have one. We'll take one more question. And the question is that uh, how does custom Android ROM fare against these modern malware attacks compared to the OEM stock ROMs? Are major custom ROMs more secure? So, um, custom Android ROMs against OEM stock ROMs. I would say that OEM stock ROMs will probably be more secure because of the fact that you don't know where, what has been embedded in the custom Android rooms. Um, that is one way that malware has been spread actually by the default embedded applications that are there that come with the custom ROMs that are now shipped into devices that people buy. So basically, the OEM stock room is likely to be more secure. We'll take one more feedback and then maybe like uh, Mrs. Asha from uh, assistant professor from Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, like uh, the introduction to botnets, uh, credential stuffing attack, uh, introduction to CN. CNN, the CNN architecture, how it is used to detect botnet and uh, normal. All these sessions are very uh, informative. Uh, hope we can have more sessions from you in the future. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for your feedback. So uh, before we close, I'd like to inform uh, each and everybody uh, to kindly fill in the feedback form, which my uh, friend uh, and colleague, Mrs. Nisha, uh, she has actually posted in the chat window. And uh, we will try to uh, give you the certificates by uh, Thursday or maybe Friday, but uh, not later than that. So kindly fill in the feedback form. I would uh, place my sincere record of thanks to all faculty members and participants and as well as researchers from different uh, uh, engineering colleges, uh, which I can see uh, like the UK of engineering college, Amal Jyoti engineering college, Tejas engineering college, government engineering college, Trishur, Hindustan university. Then I have uh, Sharanathan university, NIT, uh, 
Trichy, uh, Dr. Sabita from College of Engineering Trivandrum, then MES College of Engineering Kutipuram, Sri Buddha College of Engineering. Then uh, we have a uh, few faculty members from Rajigiri College of Social Science. Then we have uh, uh, faculty members as well as researchers from Sri Ramakrishna Engineering College, Coimbatore. Uh, then from Amrita Vishwa Vidya Peetam, Vidya Academy of Science and uh, Technology, Trishur, SNGIST group of institution. So, uh, and, and many more. So, uh, I would like to place my sincere uh, thanks to Dr. Uh, Suleiman for accepting our invitation. I have been chasing you since long and uh, it was like a surprise that, uh, that your mail came to me uh, yeah. during the pandemic and we had a lot of uh, insightful discussion and we started our uh, research maybe like in one day, I remember. Yeah. Uh, so, true. so, so, uh, I uh, like uh, it would be a long uh, collaboration that uh, from Department of Computer Science (SCMS) that is for sure. I would also like to uh, thank all my uh, uh, colleagues from Department of Computer Science and Engineering, and especially uh, Mrs. Nisha for uh, handling uh, different uh, arrangement activities. Also, the students uh, and uh, once again all faculty members who have joined us. Uh, in the uh, coming days, we have uh, a series of webinar. We will be posting uh, uh, it uh, either uh, in the Facebook as well as it would be shared from our department, from leading researchers like Dr. Yeremi, international researchers. So I would uh, request all those who are very much interested, so you can Send us, send us an invite and uh, maybe we can accommodate you. So thank you once again, uh, everyone. Special thanks to Dr. Suleiman. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. <laughs>